Welcome to the ninth meeting of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Um, this morning, the committee will be considering a package of instruments laid before the Parliament in connection with the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016. I will just wait for a minute while the Minister appears. Um, I thought he might have been here. There we are. Excellent. Morning. So, as I said this morning, the committee will be considering a package of instruments laid before the Parliament in connection with the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016. This Act was considered as lead committee by the session for Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, and as such, this committee has been designated as the lead committee for consideration of these instruments. This morning, the committee will undertake both its usual technical scrutiny and policy scrutiny as lead committee for the instruments. Item one is an opportunity for the committee to take evidence from the Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy and his officials on the instruments. This is an opportunity for the committee to ask questions on all of the bankruptcy instruments laid by the Scottish Government and to do so from both a policy and a technical perspective. So, it's my pleasant duty to welcome Minister uh, Paul Wheelhouse, who is the Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy. i also like to welcome Graham Fisher, who is the Head of Branch 1, Constitutional and Civil Law Division, Scottish Government Legal Directorate of the Scottish Government. And I'd also like to welcome Alec Reid, who's the Head of Policy Development and the Accountant in Bankruptcy. And I'd like to welcome Carol Kirk as well, who's a policy review team leader um, in the, to, the accountancy in, to the accountant in bankruptcy. So, Minister, if you have an opening statement, and I know that you have, so if you'd like to make it, then we'd be very pleased to hear from you. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, everyone. Um, the regulations before you today represent what we intend to be one of the final instrument instalments in the exercise to consolidate bankruptcy legislation in Scotland. Um, following the successful passage of the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016 through Parliament earlier this year, in which your predecessor committee, uh, as you know, Convener, played a crucial role, uh, the next step in the process is to consolidate the regulations that accompany the primary legislation. The consolidation of the regulations uh, will complement the 2016 Act to make Scotland's bankruptcy legislation more accessible for those practitioners who use it and for those affected by it. And I should firstly say something about our approach to consolidating the regulations. We propose the 2016 Act will apply to sequestrations applied for on or after 30 of, uh, of November this year and trusted uh, arrangements ex executed from that date. There are currently 11 sets of regulations which fill out the detail of primary bankruptcy legislation, which we propose to reduce to four uh, for sequestrations and trustees falling under the new Act. Uh, together with a short set of commencement regulations which will bring the act, new Act in on 30th November 2016. We consulted on draft regulations over the summer with stakeholders who provided valuable feedback on the proposals for consolidation of these regulations. And I note um, ICAS say, and wh while in some instances we may not agree with the conclusions reached, uh, we would wish to formally record our gratitude to this approach being taken. And we consider that such an approach represents best practice and can assist the Parliament to scrutinise legislation brought forward and ensure that legislation introduced is fit for purpose." Unquote. Uh, the first affirmative instrument you have before you, the Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 2016, consolidates the main, uh, the main secondary legislation under the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 1985, principally the 140 pages or so of forms used as part of the bankruptcy processes. And at this point, I would also like to highlight Regulation 14, which makes a, a minor change to the value of assets at which the simplified minimal asset process ceases to apply to address a discrepancy in how uh, newly identified assets, principally PPI uh, repayments, are treated. 
Um, the second affirmative instrument, the Protected Trusted Scotland Forms uh, Regulations 2016, provide for uh, forms to be used with protected trust deeds under the new Act. Uh, and this instrument also takes the opportunity to bring minor points in the 2016 Act forms into line with current practice. The third affirmative instrument, the Protected Trust Deeds Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016 for ease of administration, uh, mirrors minor amendments to the forms under the new Act for trust deeds under the old Act. Although technically beyond the scope of consolidating the existing regulations, it is helpful to have these considered as part of this package as they do uh, the same thing. As part of a consolidation, it is important to stress that, well, with one exception, the regulations do not introduce new policy. But where we think it's important to clarify legislation or clarify issues, we've sought to do that within these regulations, as I've mentioned. And the negative instrument on bankruptcy uh, applications and decisions, regulations 2016, also before you today, consolidates the rules uh, for proceedings before the accountant in bankruptcy for cases under the new Act. Uh, in uh, in respect of, um, I should mention that the bankruptcy fees regulations will be reviewed in the first half of 2017. They have not been consolidated at this time, but continue to apply under the transitional continuity provisions in the 2016 Act. And the accountant in bankruptcy will, however, publish details of the corresponding provisions under the new Act on its website in the meantime. Uh, introducing this package of regulations ensures that references to the new Act are changed Detailed tables of correspondence have also been prepared to assist users of the legislation in making their transition. And we've worked closely with stakeholders uh, who have provided valuable feedback on the proposals for the consolidation of these regulations. In particular, uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, or ICAS, uh, the Scottish Committee of the R3 Association of Business Recovery Professionals, and the Step Change Debt Charity as well. Uh, ICAS in particular also provided feedback on issues which we recognise as important and will seek to address, but which we consider to fall out with the scope of this exercise. The Scottish Government and the Accountant in Bankruptcy will continue to work with ICAS and other stakeholders to consider these areas separately. And I would acknowledge some relatively minor drafting issues arise uh, with two of the sets of regulations. And for the reasons we've set out to the committee, we do not see these raising practical difficulties. In the meantime, uh, but it is important to put these right, and I can confirm I will ensure that these are rectified as soon as is practicable, uh, together with the minor points raised by R3 in their response to the committee's call for evidence. I am, for example, keen to address the request from stakeholders to ensure arithmetic issues are more transparent in the forms, although I do accept that there are some reasons why the forms are laid out in the way they are. But I would like to thank the committee for taking the time to consider these instruments. So I would just finish on the fact that we have um, a reference from, from the likes of ICAST overall, uh, quote, overall and taking into account the comments we've received back from the EIB in response to the informal consultation carried out, we would support the regulations coming into effect. And I believe our three have also made similar similar remarks. And so we are, of course, uh, convener happy to take questions. OK, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Minister, for your opening statement. And can I just uh, advise uh, the Minister and our committee um, that we will start with uh, questions, technical questions, and move on to policy questions thereafter. Um, in relation to the draft protected trustees form Scotland regulations 2016, the committee will consider item two, whether to draw the regulations to the attention of the parliament on the general reporting grounds, as the regulations contain two minor drafting errors. And it's noted that the Scottish Government, and I thank the Minister for saying so, intends to correct the errors at the next legislative opportunity. However, in relation to the draft bankruptcy Scotland regulations 2016, the committee will consider item two whether to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament under the general reporting grounds as they contain drafting errors and whether to report the regulations under ground H as the meaning of regulation 22 could be clearer. The committee would like to explore this second point with you, Minister. Um, regulation 22 of the draft Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 2016 makes provision in respect of the conversion into sterling of a creditor's claim stated in foreign currency. Regulation provides that the manner of conversion is to be at a single exchange rate of for that currency as determined by the trustee with reference to prevailing exchange rates on the date of sequestration. The Scottish Government has confirmed that Regulation 22 should refer to a single exchange rate for that currency and proposes to remove the word of as a printing point in the Minister's signing copy. 
committee considers that errors in the instrument should only be corrected by way of printing point when the error in question is highly self-evident in nature and capable of no alternative interpretation. The error in Regulation 22 does not appear to the committee to be self-evident in nature, since a doubt may arise as to the intended meaning of the provision. The erroneous word of might be taken to indicate a figure that is missing from the provision. For example, the provision might be intended to read a single exchange rate of X for that currency. It is considered, therefore, that the meaning of Regulation 22 could be clearer. And so for that reason, um, the committee, if I may ask you, Minister, does not consider that the error identified in Regulation 22 should appropriately be changed as a printing point at signing. Would you consider, would you instead consider making the required regulation to the required change to Regulation 22 of the Draft Bankruptcy Scotland Regulation 2016 by an amending instrument, please, in due course? Um, firstly, I mean, uh, I will just address the, the point which you very fairly raised, convener, and uh, for, for the record, sort of apologise that 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 this having to be raised by the committee because it sh clearly should have been picked up and uh, recognise that. But thank you for raising it. The, the typographical error in Regulation 22 should uh, refer to a single exchange rate for that currency. Uh, just to confirm that, as in Regulation 11 of the Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 2014. SSI uh, 2014 stroke 225, which is consolidated and updated. And we propose that this is corrected uh, as a printing point by removing of. However, I take the point that you have made convener and we're happy to, to uh, address this through an amendment if, if that would be to the committee's um, wishes. Right. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, so I now move to other questions, if that would be all right. Uh, we've got um, a series of questions, Minister. Um, and if we could just invite the first uh, two questions from Stuart. Th thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, by changing the asset threshold at which a debtor must uh, move from the minimal asset process route into bankruptcy to the standard route, what do you think the effect uh, may be on the number of people transferred from the minimum asset process into full bankruptcy? I think, um, if I may, convener, I'll bring, maybe bring in Alex in this particular point of detail. I think the numbers will be low, um, a, there, but there have been uh, instances, um, in a low number of instances, where people in a minimal asset process bankruptcy, we've been made aware of um, a PPI compensation payments, um, which somebody in a full administration bankruptcy, that would vest in the estate and vest with the trustee, but with the threshold limits, it's not been able to be administered within the within the bankruptcy, so it's really to uh, designed to address that anomaly and introduce greater fairness in the process. Although I think we'd acknowledge that the numbers would expect it to be low, but uh, but but it's something that we felt we we needed to address. Right. When you say that you think the numbers will be low, do you have any indication uh, as to do you have any any forecasting uh, data in terms of what? The, what the final number will be? Um, I don't. I don't. I would, I would have to say that, that, we, that we don't. I, I, I know that there have been um, a, a low number of cases, um, at least two cases, where there have been um, pa these payments have, have, re have been received within the period of a minimal asset process, but I don't have any way to predict what will happen. Okay. Have you, uh, has there been any uh, information uh, possibly provided by external organisations to maybe provide an indication as to what uh, what figures that they uh, could potentially see? Um, we, I don't have that information. Uh, I, I don't have that information to hand. As I say, it was it, it, it's an anomaly that's that, that has arisen, and um, but I don't have information as to, as to pr projecting the number of people within a minimum asset process bankruptcy that that are likely to have that sort of compensation or or an, or, an, or an additional asset coming in. Okay. Um, and the uh, second question, uh, can be enough, just, uh, in, in your view, uh, does the current approach help support financial resilience among those with the lowest incomes? And therefore, is there a risk that this change, might, uh, which removes assets from this group, might be counterproductive? 
Well, I mean, I, I certainly, um, Camina, I in response to the, the first point as well, that appreciate that we are we're not furnished with information. Ideally, we'd like to be able to to um, see exactly how many people might be affected and caught up by this. Um, it is from what I can gather from the from the evidence that's been uh, shared with me is that this is dealing with a sort of a you know, potential anomaly rather than a, a huge wave of people that are being affected. So um, it's difficult, therefore, to say to what extent the current um, the current provisions are actually you know causing any disadvantage um, or, or or being uh, creating difficulty in that respect. But we have committed uh, through the exercise and working with ICAS, R3, and and with Step Change and other stakeholders to um, you know a future review. So we can we can look at picking up some of the issues that have been raised in the consultation that we felt were out with the scope of. This particular consolidation exercise, but also take into account as as the uh, practice, if you like, unfolds of, of putting through this regulation. If it does appear to be causing any difficulty, we can obviously address that later on down the line. So, I certainly commit to the member that we'll we'll keep that um, that that very much on their, our horizon as something that we'll keep an eye out for if it's causing any difficulty for those that are affected. Okay, okay. Well, that'd be helpful. Thank you. I just want to go back to you again on that, Minister, if I may. In terms of scale, I appreciate you don't want to put numbers on it, but would a low number be 1 to 10? Would a low number be 50 to 100? Would a low number be... I, I'm, I'm not coming here. I'm not close to. I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm not close to the detail of what was said in the uh, consultation in terms of the engagement with stakeholders. I, if I may, I, 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 I deflect that question to, to Alex again, just in case he's aware of any anecdotal evidence that's been given by any of the consultees that, that have been mm -hmm. involved in the, the exercise to date. No, I, I mean, as, as I say, I'm aware of of two instances so far where there's been a mineral asset process bankruptcy where the the funds have not been able to be administered within the bankruptcy um, where they would have been administered in a full administration bankruptcy. And, and I take the point about um, disadvantaging people who are in, in that group, but there is an element of unfairness if in a bankruptcy process funds are being administered in one in one route but not, not another. Um, so moving ahead, I mean, I, as I say, that, that I'm aware of, of um, two cases, but, but it, it is difficult to put a figure on the number of cases of compensation or where, where assets will arise in the future. It is difficult to do that. OK. I suppose we should welcome your natural caution. Um, uh, right. We'll move um, on to questions now from Monica Lennon. Um, Monica, if you'd like to ask your questions, please. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Minister. You mentioned in your statement that you value the feedback from stakeholders during the, the consultation over the summer. In the written evidence to, to this committee, both ICAS and R3 have argued that setting the statutory interest rate for bankruptcy debts at 8% is punitive in the current financial climate and should be reduced. How do you respond to that concern? Well, in the, the context of, of current low interest rates, I, I would agree that that 8% does seem to be punitive. Um, we are aware of this concern. I mean, I've shared my concern with the EIB as well about this, but there, there is a proposed um, consultation which is underway within uh, England and Wales, which we can learn a lot from in terms of the feedback on that. Uh, in terms of the um, interest rate, there have been suggestions around maybe having a 1.5% uh, premium on the, the the base lending rate, the Bank of England maybe is a more acceptable uh, mechanism, which might be fairer. Um, and uh, I'm sympathetic to those kind of arguments, but we we want to kind of learn from the exercise that's being undertaken in England. Wales. rather than have two separate kind of consultations on the same subject running concurrently. Um, we can learn from that, and if need be, adjust our approach based on the the evidence that comes forward at that point. So I do appreciate stakeholders have said there's there's no need minister or no need AIB to have exactly the same approach that's taken in England and Wales, but we can learn in this case from a consultation on, on, on this issue uh, and then decide either to, to, to take a similar approach to England and Wales or, or decide if we feel that the approach that they take is, is still too punitive to do something uh, which is more appropriate. So I'm very much aware of the issue and I do agree 8% is uh, unacceptably high at this point in time, but uh, we, we do uh, want to, to see the outcome of that consultation and learn from that. I mean, it has been this committee's understanding that the Scottish Government um, did prefer to wait <coughs> for the results of the review of um, interest rates in England and Wales before considering changes here. But I just wonder why not look at it now? Do we know how long that, that could take? And is consideration being given to setting the Scottish interest rate separately? 
Well, uh, as I was saying, we, we, we haven't set out in a path where we are um, you know, deliberately going out of our way to have a different approach to England and Wales. I do accept the principle that 8% does seem you know, unusually high, given we've got very low base rates at this moment in time. It doesn't seem to have moved in line with uh, the, the move down in terms of base rates, and that uh, therefore means people are paying uh, perhaps a, a higher rate than, than, than might be justified uh, in the current circumstances. I think we can learn from the exercise that's being done in England and Wales, and once we have the outcome of that, if, if um, England and Wales decide to, to themselves reduce the rates, then, then in theory we could either go and set a similar level to, to England and Wales, or if we feel that the rate they conclude is appropriate is still too high, we can do do our own thing and have a, have a different rate. But I certainly give the member a commitment that we will be looking at this issue, and if need be, we'll take a different path. Uh, to that in England and Wales, but we can learn from the consultation which is involving the same stakeholders we'd be consulting with um, you know, in terms of the professional bodies, the, um, those advising individuals on debt issues, uh, and uh, we can learn from the submissions they make to the, to the England and Wales exercise and, and take that forward. And is there a, a time scale for that? I and mean, if it starts to take too long in England and Wales, is there a point where you think Scotland really can't wait to... <coughs> to learn from our neighbours? I, I, on the general principle, if it was taking too long, yes, we, we could potentially act, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll consult colleagues on, on the precise timing of that consultation just to make sure the committee are informed of when that's likely to conclude. I don't know if Alex, you can address that. We've been advised it's, 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 it's due, but I, I don't have a specific... We haven't, we've, we've asked for timings, but I don't have a specific timing yet. But clearly, if, if it was... Relatively yeah. soon. Yes, we would. Yes. yes. I mean, we have no reason to believe that it will be delayed, you know, unduly by, by, by the authorities in England and Wales. Thank you. Right. Thank you, uh, Monica. Um, I've got a question now um, about conflicts of interest. And given concerns among stakeholders about conflicts of interest in the accountancy and bankruptcy's decision making rules, was any consideration given to introducing new procedures in these regulations to avoid such conflicts of interest? Well, I, I certainly note the points that have been made by, by ICAS in particular on this and <clears throat> in regards to the um, appointment of, of those to the, the review uh, panel um, and um, you know the potential that there there is to, to, if not an actual conflict, and just the perception of one to exist. So... I think it's an issue that I'm quite keen to ensure that, because I think AIB is a very impressive organisation, do an excellent job. I don't want any uh, potential mud to be sl slung at the at the organisation, um, fair or unfair, and I think it would be in their interest as well as uh, the wider interests of transparency to have that addressed. Uh, so I don't think there's any suggestion, convener, of any impropriety, but I think the um, uh, the fact that, um, uh, as I understand it, the, the, the members of the, the panel are appointed by AIB, that, that while well, they're perfectly um, uh, good individuals, I am sure, uh, to have them appointed and at least overseen uh, to some extent by whatever mechanism uh, independently um, uh, uh, validated would be, would be helpful, I think, in ensuring that there was no potential for any conflict of interest to be perceived. Uh, so uh, that's something I think falls out with the role of the consolidating regulations that we're discussing today, but it's something that we could take forward under the, the future review that was um, that was discussed as well. You would look at that in future. I mean, so you don't really accept ICAS's and, and, and R3's view that an opportunity has been missed here to, to make it I, process more transparent and wider I th I think, than white. I think, I would I would accept that. I think it's a legitimate point to address. Um, I think because of the, uh, the need to ensure we have regulations through in time for the 30th of November, uh, timing may not be perfect uh, to address that at this point in time, but I, I certainly commit to the committee that um, we will look at that issue and, and, and address that issue as soon as practicable um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the forthcoming review of, of that has been proposed uh, by AIB. Okay, um, thanks very much. Uh, Rachel, Questions, please, Rachel Hamilton. Yeah, my question involves um, a point that a number of stakeholders have drawn to our attention. <clears throat> regulation 5.1.G of the Draft Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 2016 requires that a money advisor must be licensed to use the common financial statement by the Money Advice Trust. Mm -hmm. ICAS and R3 suggest that money advisors will, in effect, be regulated by the Money Advice Trust as a result of this requirement. 
They suggest that it is inappropriate for this matter to be in control of an unaccountable third party as opposed to a public body. Does the Minister share these concerns? Well, I certainly recognise the point that's been made. Um, I, I've, I've tried to understand myself why, why this has arisen, and I'll invite colleagues to comment on this shortly if I may, Convener. But I think um, it's important to recognise that we are represented, the Scottish Government and the AIB, you know, through, through, through AIB, is, is represented on MAT as an organisation. So we have a voice. And if there were specific Scottish cases that came forward, uh, we would have an expectation that the, the um, perspective, if you like, of EIB would be listened to as to the circumstances of that uh, money advisor being um, called, their, their conduct being called into question or their use of appropriate regulation being uh, called into question. So uh, I'm confident that, that Scottish cases would be dealt with having listened to the evidence around the circumstances as they applied in Scotland. Um, however, I, I do accept that you know uh, that it may look somewhat odd to 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 a third party audience that this is the situation that's arisen. Um, now I understand I'll ask colleagues to come in on this, but I understand it was because of the, uh, the 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 various tools that are being used by money advisors in terms of collecting the evidence, whether it's the the financial tools and so forth, are are themselves regulated by MAT. That there's a there's a logic in having MAT oversight, having oversight of the conduct of the individuals who are giving the money advice. But if we can perhaps bring in uh, Graham uh, Fisher and Alex Reid on on this, just to provide some background as to why we've ended up with MAT in this particular role, if that would be helpful, convener. I think this goes back to the consultation um, from the bank, the bankruptcy and debt advice Scotland reforms, um, and the general um, approach that having a common financial tool to assess income and expenditure um, introduced a level of consistency and transparency in the process so that, where possible, debtors were being treated fairly. There, 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 there are a number of different mechanisms for calculating income and expenditure. So that was part of the consultation. Um, and the consultation agreed that the common financial statement, um, which is available through licence from the Money Advice Trust, was the most appropriate tool to use and be adopted and prescribed in legislation as the common financial tool. Uh, and that, that, that has been operating. Now, because the, the access then to the common financial statement becomes critical in the process of the, undertaking the, the, the function of money advisor in bankruptcy, it becomes a prerequisite of undertaking that, that function. Um, but to the best of our knowledge, the, the, we don't think that the Money Advice Trust have, re, have, re, have revoked um, a licence. Um, they haven't informed us of that, and we have, we're certainly not aware of it having been an issue in the past. Um, uh, as, as I say, and I think we would, you know, we would, we would need to sort of react to, to anything that happened in the future on that basis. But we are where we are, I think, because that tool was accepted as being the most effective way to introduce some consistency and transparency across these calculations. Um, Could I add a point there? Um, can I push you on how you will uh, monitor the situation and to ensure that you do have accountability? Well, the, 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 within the legislation, we have to ensure that we're, for example, setting debtor contribution orders. Um, there is, we, we have to ensure that income and expenditure, the, the common financial tool, is being applied properly and appropriately. That, that happens on an ongoing basis when we are dealing with debtor application processes or where we're dealing with variations in um, debtor contributions or indeed looking at the contribution levels in protected trust deeds, which are also calculated using the common financial tool. So that, on an operational basis, that happens um, on an ongoing basis. And, and, and in fact, if we had particular concerns about a money advisor or a money advice organisation, we would most certainly raise those concerns um, with, with the organisation. Um, ultimately, we, it could be raised with the Money Advice Trust, but we haven't had to deal with that um, situation yet. Clearly, we, on a case-by-case -case basis, we have queries that go backwards and forwards on terms of the way that the common financial tool has been applied. But, um, but, but, but in terms of monitoring it, that happens on an ongoing basis. If, if I could add, convener, I think it's important. Uh, it's important to recognise. I mean, I understand uh, Rachel Hamilton's uh, point there, and I think it's a fair point to say, well, 
will you will you keep an eye on whether this is working in practice um, it's certainly something that we could we could look at again during the future policy review we could come back and sort of understand if there's been any examples of, of this not working in practice if there have been concerns about perhaps um, uh, the, the, the decision not taking account of circumstances as they apply in Scotland and that we haven't had a chance to intervene or, or to have a say, then th those are the kind of opportunities that might lend themselves to us to actually review, well, is this still appropriate for us to go forward in, on this basis or should we do something differently? Uh, so we can, we can have a look at that uh, at the time of the future policy review, if that would be of help to, to the committee to give reassurance around the role of MAT and to ensure that it is actually acting in the interests of of uh, good governance of the policy in Scotland and uh, in, in that intent. Yeah, I think that would be helpful um, for reassurance on that point. Um, my second question is, um, ICAS has raised concerns about the absence of the appeal process against a decision by the accountant in bankruptcy to withdraw a money advisor's approved status. Mm -hmm. Does the minister think that money advisors should have a right of review against an accountant in bankruptcy decision to remove their approved status? Well, I, th I think um, in, on the general principle, absolutely. I mean, everyone deserves a right to to have have their say if they're charged with something to be able to uh, to rebut the the charges and uh, the the sort of on the sort of principles of good good natural justice, if you like, that that apply in the, in our courts. That's something that's very important in our court system. Uh, so yes, I, I agree that that is important, and that's something I've I've asked colleagues who are with me today to have a look at in the context of. Uh, the future policy review, because I think the more we can design out the need for someone to use a judicial review as a as a means of um, questioning a decision that's been made about them, it's a very heavy-handed uh, approach to uh, potentially, you know, some GRs can can be very expensive for those involved, and I think we'd, we'd like to ideally have a route which is uh, more of an administrative justice type route, which is lower lower cost and and fact based and and hopefully less contentious and, and can be dealt with quickly. So uh, we'll have a look at what can be done there. Um, but to provide reassurance, there is some protection, obviously, through judicial review, though. So what I'm saying is there is a route for someone to appeal uh, or to, to raise concerns about the process that's been uh, undertaken in terms of their having their licence revoked. Uh, but I don't think it's necessarily the, the most... Um, uh, you know, the most efficient means of doing that from a point of view of you know being a relatively onerous process to go through a judicial review. So I'm certainly happy to, to look at that under the future policy review and see if there's some improvement. And I think, again, it will provide confidence in the system if there's a is a, a appropriate course to, to appeal if you feel that you've been done an injustice. Do you have a timescale on uh, what you're proposing? In terms of the future policy yes. review? Uh, not as yet, but I will happily come back to committee. That's something I want to discuss with the EIB myself and just see if we can get some certainty around that. Unless um, uh, in the passage of time, Alex can update me as to something that's been determined already, but I'm not aware of a fixed time scale. But it's not a fixed time. We have discussed the need for the policy review and all aspects of the reforms that were introduced. Um, the, work, the reforms are quite ranging, uh, wide ranging. So some, some of the uh, policies that were introduced, for example, on debtor discharge and uh, um, variation on debtor contribution order, although it's been introduced since April 2015, some of these processes um, we, we don't have a great deal of experience to learn from um, because they happen some way down the line within the, the, the administration of a case. But certainly we are um, recognising the need that obviously as a, as, um, a significant amount of change was introduced at that time that will be subject to policy review and we are discussing the appropriate time that we should we should we should um, uh, be undertaking that but it hasn't been fixed just yet if I may just add I mean clearly this is one issue that falls into a family of issues we've already discussed today which are perhaps beyond the scope of the secondary regulations and legislation itself in terms of the regulations but I think are are worthy issues you know that that would be worth taking forward and having further discussion around. So I think um, future policy review will, will mop up a number of these issues and hopefully come to a, a, a constructive place in terms of addressing them. Uh, so we do recognise there are legitimate issues have been raised by ICAS, R3 and others, um, and indeed the committee today, but we uh, feel it's more appropriate to deal with it separately than through the through the, the regulations, because these are really bringing into, into effect the intent of Parliament when it passed the Act um, unanimously. and. Uh, uh, we can deal with the other issues which arise through the consultation in a separate separate vehicle. Thank you. 
that you finished, Rachel. Okay, has anyone else got anything further to add? And if not, uh, well, we'll now move on to the debate on the motions recommending approval of the affirmative instruments, which is also agenda item two. And we will consider the three motions recommending approval of the three affirmative instruments. Can I just remind officials that they are not able to participate in this formal debate on the motions and advise that in accordance with Rule 10.6.3 of Standing Orders, the debate on the motions can last no longer than 90 minutes. So I now invite the Minister to move and speak to motions S5M02136, S5M02137 and S5M02138. Minister. Um, formally moved, Convener. I have no, no further comments to make. OK, thank you very much. Um, are there any uh, contributions members wish to make um, or not? No. OK, thank you. Um, so that was a relatively short uh, debate, Minister, which I'm sure you're very glad about. Um, however, you might wish to respond um, and move matters forward if you'd like to. Uh, thank, thank you, Convener. I, I'm, I'm grateful for the committee's consideration of the regulations and I'm happy to take forward the points we've discussed today in terms of further work that needs to, to be done. I think um, it's very helpful to have the committee you know, have such detailed oversight of the regulations and that's helpful to us and to EIB, so thank you for your, your consideration. OK, thank you very much. Um, so can I now just uh, advise you that I intend to go... Uh, through each of the instruments and associated motions in turn. And in terms of the protected trusted forms, Scotland regulations 2016 and references to section 171i of the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016 in the entry for form three in the list of forms used in connection with protected trust deeds contained in the schedule and in the heading two form three in the schedule. <coughs> It should be referenced to section 1711i. Does the committee agree to draw the regulations to the attention of Parliament on the general reporting grounds as they can to contain two minor drafting errors? Thank you. Does the committee agree to welcome the Scottish Government's intention to correct the, error, the errors at the next legislative opportunity? Thank you. Motion S5M02136 invites the committee to recommend to the Parliament that the draft protected trust deeds forms Scotland regulations be approved. Does the committee agree to that motion? Thank you. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the draft protected trust deeds Scotland amendment regulations 2016. Is the committee content with this instrument from a technical perspective? Thank you. Motion S5M02137 invites the committee to recommend to the Parliament that the draft protected trust deeds Scotland amendment regulations 2016 be approved. Does the committee agree to the motion? Thank you. Turning now to the draft Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 2016, Regulation 22 makes provision in respect of the conversion into sterling of a creditor's claim stated in a foreign currency. The regulation provides that the manner of conversion is to be at a single exchange rate of for that currency as determined by the trustee with reference to prevailing exchange rates on the date of sequestration. The Scottish Government has confirmed that regulation. Sorry? Yeah, the Scottish Government have, have agreed to amend that uh, and lay an, an amending instrument. Um, so we welcome that. So, does the committee agree to draw, nonetheless, the draft instrument to the attention of the Parliament under reporting grounds H as the meaning of regulation 22 of the instrument could be clearer? Thank you. So, yeah. so, in addition, uh, the draft instrument contains the following drafting errors. 
firstly, the definition of common financial tool in Regulation 2 refers incorrectly to Regulations 14 to 16. The reference should instead be to Regulations 15 to 17. The Committee may wish to accept the Scottish Government's proposals to correct this error as a printing point in the Minister's signing copy, since the error is minor and highly self-evident. Form 27 in Schedule 1 of the regulations refers incorrectly to Section 141 of the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 1985 as amended. The reference should instead be to Section 141 of the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016. The committee may wish to note that the Scottish Government intends to correct this error at the next legislative opportunity. And thirdly, in the notes to Form 26, the third bullet point should refer to a fine imposed in a Justice of the Peace Court or a District Court, rather than to a fine imposed in a District Court only. Committee may wish to note that the Scottish Government intends to correct this error at the next legislative opportunity. And so does the committee agree to draw the draft instruments to the attention of the Parliament under the general reporting grounds on account of these drafting errors? Agreed. Thank you. And does the committee agree to welcome the Scottish Government's intention to correct these errors? Thank you. Finally, motion S5M02138 invites the committee to recommend to the Parliament that the draft Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 2016 be approved. Does the committee agree to the motion? Agreed. Excellent. So it only remains now uh, for me to thank the Minister and his officials for their evidence um, and coming here to be with us today. I'm very grateful, Minister. And I now allow you to leave, if you like, and I'll suspend the meeting just for a few minutes while the Minister and his team take their leave. Thank you, Minister. Everyone, and we'll now move to agenda item three, which is consideration of a negative instrument, which is part of the package of instruments connected to the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Bankruptcy Applications and Decisions Scotland Regulations 2016, SSI 2016 slash 295. Is the committee content with this instrument from a technical perspective? Thank you. Uh, from a lead committee perspective, is the committee content to note the instrument and make no recommendation? Thank you. We now move to agenda item four, which is consideration of an instrument not subject to any parliamentary procedure, which is part of the package of instruments connected to the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016. 
and no points have been raised by our legal advisers on Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016 Commencement Regulations 2016 SSI 2016-294. Is the committee content with this instrument from a technical perspective? Thank you. And from a lead committee perspective, is the committee content to note the instrument and make no recommendation? Thank you. In relation to all of the instruments, um, does the committee wish to draw the attention, uh, uh, draw to the attention of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee uh, the, policy, the policy evidence that we've taken today? Right, thank you. And before uh, we move on to the next item on the agenda, I am remiss in as much as we have received um, Apologies from David Torrance today, which we didn't announce at the beginning of the meeting, so I'll put that on the record now. We're sorry he can't be with us. So, we now move to Agenda Item 5, uh, which is the consideration of instruments subject to affirmative procedure, and no points have been raised by our legal advisers on the following affirmative instruments. The Draft Air Weapons Licensing Exemptions, Scotland Regulation 2016, or the Draft Crofting Commission Elections Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016. Is the committee content with these instruments? Thank you. Agenda item six is the consideration of instruments subject to negative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the following negative instruments. The Act of Sederant Fees of solicitors and shorthand writers in the Court of Session, Sheriff Appeal Court and Sheriff Court Amendment 2016, SSI 2016-316, or the General Pharmaceutical Council Amendment of Miscellaneous Provisions, Rules Order of Council 2016, SI 2016-1008. Is the committee content with these uh, instruments? Thank you. Agenda item seven is the consideration of instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure, and the act of and, and they are the act of Sedernt Sheriff Court Bankruptcy Rules 2016, SSI 2016/313, Form 6.1. Hyphen A in Schedule 1 of the instrument contains the following drafting errors. Some text is missing from the second and alternative subparagraph B of paragraph 3, where petitioner is a trustee under a trustee of the statement of facts. The paragraph should read, It would be in the best interest of the creditors that an award of sequestration be made. And the first subparagraph B of paragraph 3, where a petitioner is a trustee under a trustee of the statement of facts, should refer in the italicised note to the debtor rather than to the respondent. So, does the committee agree to draw the instrument to the attention of Parliament on general reporting ground on account of these drafting errors? Thank you. Does the committee also agree to welcome that the Lord President's private office plans to correct these errors before the instrument comes into force on the 30th of November 2016? Thank you. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the following instruments, the Act of Sedan Rules of the Court of Session, Sheriff Appeal Court Rules and Sheriff Court Rules Amendment, Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016 SSI 2016-312 or the Act of Sedernant Rules of the Court of Session 1994 and Sheriff Court Rules Amendment No. 4, Simple Procedure 2016 SSI 2016-315 or the Act of Sedernant Rules of the Court of Session 1994 Amendment, Postal Administration 2016 SSI 2016-318, 
or the Act of Sedent Rules of the Court of Session, 1994, and Summary Application Rules, 1999 Amendment, Serious Crime Prevention Orders, etc. 2016 SSI 2016 slash 319 or the Scottish Fis Fiscal Commission Act 2016 Commencement and Transitory Provision Regulations 2016 SSI 2016 slash 326 Is the committee content with these instruments? Thank you. In relation to SSI 2016-315, does the committee agree to welcome that in respect of an undertaking previously given by the Lord President's private office, various provisions in the instrument promptly correct errors reported upon by the committee in relation to the Act of Sedan Simple Procedure 2016 SSI 2016-200. So, uh, will we welcome that, please? Th thank you. And so, we come to the end of the meeting. And so, I thank you very much for your attention and help uh, this morning. I now close this meeting. Thank you.